John chapter 5, verses 1 through 15, I, I'm really going to walk through the scripture and kind of set the table, and I've got three points, and I'm, I'm done. Um, I have half the amount of notes that I normally have in terms of my, my manuscript, because I think that there's something that we just need to pull from in, in the spirit realm. Um, so will you stay with me? Walk with me through this scripture. John chapter 5, verse 1. Scripture says, after this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew, Bethesda, having five porches. And in these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. And then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. So it was the belief at that time that there was this area, Bethesda, and there were five porches surrounding this great pool of water. And it was believed that at a certain point in the day, an angel would come and stir up the water. The first person that got into the water got their healing for that day. Verse 5 says, Now a certain man who was there had an infirmity of 38 years. He had an illness of 38 years. We continue to find out that this man was lame. He could not walk. And I believe it says that he had this illness for 38 years because um, it's distinguishing that something happened over the course of his life to injure him and to cause him to get to this place of partial paralysis. Sometimes when you see Jesus encountering someone, it'll say that they were blind from birth. But this is very specific about the number of years that this man had been sick and an invalid and a lame. Scripture says, verse 6, when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been in that condition a long time, Jesus said to him, do you want to be made well? Now I'm looking at that and I think everybody in here would probably answer, yes, absolutely, I can't walk. Of course I would love to be made well. But it's interesting because this man doesn't really answer Jesus' question directly. Verse 7, the sick man answered him and said, sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I'm coming, another one steps down before me and in, uh, in other words, um, this dude is focused on what people haven't done for him. You know, them people, they, they, they don't help me. And then everybody else gets in before me, so here I am, and this is why I'm in the state that I'm in. Jesus says to him, rise, take up your bed, and walk. Your translation might say, get up. Get on up. <laughs> it's my 70s reference for today. So it says, and immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked, and that day was the Sabbath. The Jews therefore said to him, who was cured, it is the Sabbath, is it not lawful for you to carry your bed? Now when you read the Gospels, you see certain characters in Scripture, of course you have Jesus, but then you have the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes, these were the religious elite. They were the keepers of the law. They knew the law like the back of their hand, but they did not know God. So they were trying to check this man because the law of Moses said that you couldn't work on the Sabbath. And here you see this man carrying his mat, which technically was a violation of the Sabbath. And in verse 11, he answered them and said, he who made me well said to me, take up your bed and walk. Now, if you pay attention to that, you'll see that he really didn't quite know who Jesus was yet. He didn't quite realize that he had encountered the Son of God, the Messiah who had came to save people from their sins. So they asked him, who is this man who you said, said to you, take up your bed and walk? But the one who was healed did not know who he was, for Jesus had withdrawn in a multitude being in that place. Afterwards, Jesus found him in the temple, looked at him and said, See, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him 
well. This is the word of the Lord and the church said, amen. I, I want to speak into your life for just a moment from the topic, I'm tired of being lame. I'm tired of being lame. Holy Spirit, take this word, combine it with this powerful worship moment we just had. And I pray that someone will take up their mat and walk today. But I also pray that they'll really know who Jesus is and sin no more. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I, I, I took some time to really prepare for this message by just talking with the Lord. And some of you have heard me preach this passage before and you've heard this text before. And what I love about God's word is that you can look at it with fresh eyes. You can look at it at the backdrop of where we are in culture and society. And because God's word is so rich and so multifaceted, there are things that are drawn out based on where we are in the culture. I was reflecting on the nature of the church. Because when I look at the pool of Bethesda, the pool of Bethsaida, it, 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 it represents a place where people come and congregate. And the people who were congregating at that time were the blind, the lame, the sick. And it got me thinking about the nature of the church. Because sometimes the church attracts the blind, the lame, and the sick. The physically and spiritually disabled. Now, that makes sense because Jesus presented himself as the physician, and he made it very clear that he came to heal those who were sick. Because if you feel like you're already well, then you have no need of a physician. So we know, according to Scripture, that Jesus does present himself as a doctor, and oftentimes will describe the church as a hospital. It is indeed the type of place where someone can come in their brokenness. Where you come as you are. Will you come with your pain? Will you come with your brokenness? Will you come with your misgivings and your missteps? And I tell people this often that when you are injured, you don't try to fix and heal yourself before you go to the emergency room. You go to the place where the experts can take care of you. So in many respects, the church is like an emergency room where there are people who are designated to try to help those who are hurting those who are in pain. But, but here's what I wrestle with, because at some point you have to be discharged from the hospital. What I wrestle with is that, yes, the church is a hospital, but everybody can't be sick. Yes, the church is a place for healing, but, 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 but what happens when people leave just as broken as when they arrived. When we look at this pool that this man was at, he arrived every single day to a place that supposedly had power, yet he left unchanged. I found that people come to the house of God for different reasons. People come because others are there. People come because they believe that there's something there for them, that there's some power, and they don't know how that power is transferred to them, but they just keep on showing up. But, but, but this is what I want to suggest to you today, that we can't just keep on gathering and not being healed from the infirmities that persist in our lives, that at some point we have to move from the emergency room to a place of being healthy. So the church, and remember the church is not just a building. The church is not just a denomination. The church is a people, and we are a part of a greater kingdom. So maybe it starts off like an emergency room, but really the kingdom of God is like an entire healthcare system. Perhaps there are certain things that we should be learning in terms of preventative help that keeps us from having to go to the emergency room. 
Maybe there are people that God has placed in the economy of the kingdom, pastors, teachers, apostles, prophets, people who have been sent by God to help us be built up, to be equipped so we don't spend all of our time in the emergency room so that we can sometimes even avoid the injuries of those who came before us. So in many respects, we might start in the emergency room, but at some point we have to move on to a place of health and a place of strength. But here's what I notice about today's culture. Sometimes we are perfectly fine staying in our mess. Sometimes we are perfectly fine being identified with our difficulties. Sometimes when brokenness has been your friend for far too long, you would actually miss it if it was no longer there. And it's this weird spiritual, psychological thing that happens with a person when they begin to identify themselves with their problem, identify themselves with their issues, they begin to identify themselves with their illness. And no doubt this man had gotten to the point of being called the lame man, being called the paralyzed man, and that became his identity. So much so that when Jesus, the one who had the power to heal him, showed up and asked him if he wanted to be made well, Instead of saying yes, he began to talk about people and what they didn't do. This is what we call the language of victimhood. When it's always somebody else's fault. I didn't have anybody to help me get into the pool. When it's my turn to get in the pool, somebody stepped in front of me. Watch this. Somebody did something to me when I was younger, which you can't control. That's what happened. But the question is, here's my 70s anointing, what's happening? What is God doing now to bring recovery for you and to help you overcome what happened back then? I'm disappointed because I was hoping that something would have happened by now or I was overlooked or I was harmed by someone or no one ever gave me an opportunity. And God is standing before you saying, do you want to be made whole? And sometimes we get so comfortable in our mess, in our situation, that we don't even have the language to be able to accept the healing that God himself is presenting. So the question for you today is are you tired of being lame? See, the thing about being lame is that you can be lame physically, but you can also be lame emotionally and spiritually. When someone is lame, they've been injured to the point that it hinders their ability to walk. When you are lame emotionally, you've been so damaged emotionally that, that, that it hinders your ability to be able to properly navigate life when you have become lame spiritually you spend a whole lot of time around the pool yet you never actually get the healing that you say that you came for so all I have today is three questions that's it three questions for you today question number one do you want to be made whole sounds like a simple question But even this lame man couldn't really answer it. Do you want to be made whole? Do do, do you want to be made whole? See, that word want speaks to desire. Do you desire to be healed? And what I found is that even sometimes in the church, we can give lip service to things. We say the things that we feel like we should say in order to be accepted by Christian people. So sometimes we have the language down, but our heart is not connected to the language that we're speaking. We sing songs, and we don't even believe the power of the songs that we're singing because we think it's just a song that you sing rather than seeing it as a declaration 
that's designed to help you to be able to walk according to the scriptures and actually do what the song is saying. So we sing about lifting Jesus up, yet we don't lift Jesus up. We're just singing about lifting him up. But if you really know Jesus, you have a relationship with him, and the scriptures have taught you that he is indeed the son of God and he's worthy to be lifted up, then when the song says lift him up, what do you do? You lift him up as you sing the song. But sometimes there's a disconnect between what we say and what we actually believe. And every once in a while, we say things that indicate what we really believe. And in this moment, the speech of this man betrayed him. Jesus asked him if he wants to be made whole. He started talking about people. Here's something interesting that I've noticed in my work as a pastor. Listen to me. Some people want to be heard more than they want to be whole. Now, this is an ethos of our culture because in our culture, we put emphasis on narrative. We put emphasis on story, people telling their stories. In a diverse, pluralistic society, everybody's got a story. Everybody's got an experience. But there comes a certain point where you got to ask yourself the question, do you want to be healed or do you want to be heard? What I found is that sometimes people find comfort in rehearsing their hurt. And sometimes they just want the therapy of people hearing how they've been hurt rather than actually fixing the hurt that they continue to talk about. Because in us sharing our hurt, there's the attention that we so desperately want. Do we want attention or do we want the anointing? Attention says, look at me lying by the pool and all the issues and problems that I've had. Attention says, let me share how difficult things have been for me once again because I have an audience that can hear all the troubles that I've been through. And I get it. There's a time and there's a space for you to get off of your chest what's happened to you in your life, but you can't live there forever. At some point, your trauma has to transform into triumph. But my concern is that people want to be heard more than they want to be healed. Because at a certain point, this is the dream girl's anointing. <laughs> Effie, we all got pain. I, I, I feel you. And yes, my pain is not your pain, but can we agree that everybody has pain? And according to the book of Hebrews, we have someone who can sympathize with our weakness. His name is Jesus. He's the better sacrifice. He's the better high priest. He's made provision for your pain. At some point, we got to say that the cross equalizes us. And you know what? I haven't been exactly through what you've been through, but let me tell you about a man who can help you. Let me tell you about a man who, regardless of what your past has been, regardless of what your issues have been, join me as I bow down to the same man that you can bow down to, and he's the one who can help you. He's the one that can heal you. But what happens when we push him out of the equation? This is the danger of religion. Because everybody's showing up for different reasons. But when you've really had an encounter with Jesus, listen, when you've really submitted to him as Lord, when he really becomes Lord over your life, it changes and transforms you from the inside out, and you have to move from casual Christianity to fervent followership. When you really had an encounter with the Lord, when you really believe, it changes you from the inside out. And listen, it even puts into perspective the things that happened in your past. You realize when you meet Jesus, 
Romans 8 and 28 says that we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. Even the difficult things of my past, even my missteps, even my problems, even my pain, according to the scripture, it's all working together for my good. What can separate me from the love of Jesus? Nothing. So now I become acquainted with his love. And so now my narrative is no longer about the hurt of my past, but my narrative is about this relationship that I found and what God is doing for me for my future it's a shift in perspective somebody say shift and at some point we have to embrace the healing power of God now but the question is do you want to be made whole do do you really want to change Sometimes, as, as pastors, my, my wife and I, we, we have the responsibility of counseling people, counseling people. But it's an interesting counseling session when people come to you to get counseled, and then you give them counsel, and they don't receive what you're saying. They just want to talk about. <laughs> they, they just want to talk about what they want to talk about. And you find very quickly, <laughs> they just look for somebody to talk to. But, but at a certain point, you got to ask yourself the question, are you ready to make the pivot for your transformation and for your healing? And what I find more often than not, people become comfortable in their narrative. Now your narrative will bring you before talk show hosts, Instagram interviews. You know, it, it, it's something that I, I think we have to be discerning about and I'm not negating anyone's testimony I'm not negating what you've been through but this man was standing before the one who could help him and he couldn't even answer the question as to whether or not he wanted to be made whole because he immediately went to his narrative do you want to be healed do you want to be heard sometimes people wonder why why don't we do more altar calls one COVID is here so believe in the power of the Holy Spirit and utilizing wisdom but before COVID hit what you need to know about new vision is that we are led by the spirit we do what the spirit is leading us to do so the spirit says rearrange the service and put the giving all the stuff at the end and trust God then that's what we do the spirit says pull from a hymn you heard contemporary music today then we went all the way back you know that burgundy book that you had at your church growing up Baptist we that we pull from that book because we do what the Spirit is leading us to do. There, there are times when we get a little prophetic. There are times when we just teach the word. But I've had people give feedback about uh, sometimes the lack of altar calls. And they're looking for those moments, you know, those deep moments where we scan the crowd. We find somebody, we speak to them. Say, you over there, stand up. <laughs> people waiting for those moments. And we, we've had moments where, you know, some of y'all have been in those moments where, you know, the Lord leads us to anoint people and you lay hands and they fall out. And I'm saying that God can move that way. Yes, he can. Sometimes people just want to fall out. What if God hasn't given you an anointing to fall out? What if he wants to give you an anointing to stand up? Because some of us keep on falling out, then we just get right back up and go back to what we're doing. Where's the power? Now, some of you know what it's like. Holy Spirit hits you, you fall out, and you a changed man and a changed woman. I'm down with that. But we ain't just going to be falling out for the sake of falling out. But we're waiting for someone to pick us up and put us in the water. And then we get mad when they don't prophesy to us. Be careful when you're going to prophetic gatherings, longing for, hungering for somebody to speak a word to you. You know, sometimes people have a look, like, speak to me. I'm just saying, every prophet ain't verified. He's looking for the people, okay, who look like they need a word. Who look like they need a word. Who look like they need a word. You over there, you over there. (laughs) 
And then, those of you who don't get selected, you're just mad at God. I thought this was going to be my night. I thought somebody was going to speak into my life. Listen, because you had something that you wanted, so you went to the prophet with itching ears, because you wanted to hear something that confirmed what you had already started and initiated. Because you want somebody to pick you up and dip you in the water. And then you get mad when somebody gets their word and you didn't get yours, and here we go. It just reinforces the narrative. Woe is me. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Nobody knows my sorrow. You just, that's your refrain. The question is, do you want to be heard or do you want to be healed? Sometimes people want attention on them. So people can see them falling out on the floor. You want attention? Do you want the anointing? The anointing can jump over rows, find you in your seat. You haven't moved, but you received the word. You accepted it with gladness in your heart. Sometimes the anointing is in the preach word without the altar call. You got all the anointing you need in the book if you would do what the book is telling you to do. And so you're waiting for your moment. Your moment has already arrived. The Holy Spirit is already inside of you. Now walk according to what you heard. Ask yourself, do you want to be healed? Do you want to be healed? Do you want to be transformed? Now, I need you to understand that the healing of God doesn't mean the absence of problems, doesn't mean the absence of struggle. But it means, one, the confirmation of relationship. You know who your God is, and you know the one whom you had an encounter with. It also means that now you are trusting and relying on the power of the Holy Spirit. Not just, not just the flesh, but, but you have had an encounter with the Lord. You verified his word. And guess what? You are now trusting in him to help you continue and the initial healing that you have experienced. Second thing, are you ready to let go of your victimhood? Victimhood has a language. You see it in this man sitting by the pool. I have no one to put me in the pool. Everyone else gets in before me. I told you that lameness is not just a physical condition. It can also be an emotional condition. Beware of people who are emotionally crippled, always looking for a crutch, always looking for someone to blame, always looking for someone to, to push the responsibility to. Listen, it's always someone's fault. Here's the reality of life. There are moments when it is other people's fault, but it's not always somebody's fault. And it takes wisdom to be able to distinguish the two. But when we have a language of victimhood, it's always somebody else's fault. It's always somebody else's issue. It's always what someone else did. And it's never, ever really what I have done or failed to do. This man seemed obsessed with the fact that people had overlooked him, disregarded him. I just believe in my spirit for many of you, this is the season for you to shift from being the victim to becoming the victor, which acknowledges, listen to me, that you've had hurt, that you've had pain, that you've had difficulty, that you've had issues. Acknowledge it. But at some point, you have to meditate on those things which are noble, which are holy, which are pure. If you look at the book of Philippians chapter 4, um, it talks about uh, what we should focus on. It's getting to a point where you're saying, you know what, I, I want there to be so much of the word of God in me. I want to spend so much time in the presence of the Lord. I, I want to get to the place where I am so devoted, so committed, so filled with the spirit of God that now my testimony transforms. Not just from what happened in my past, but what God is doing in me in the present. Too often we're focused on the testimony of the past, but we don't testify to what God is doing for us right now. And it is the trick of the enemy to convince you that everything is bad. 
Yes, life is tough. Yes, there are trials and tribulations. Yes, there are issues and problems. Yes, there are systematic ills and and difficulties in society. Yes, all those things are true. But don't you forget the reality that there is a God in heaven who cares about his people. Don't you forget that there is a Father in heaven who's providing everything that you need. Watch this. You may not have everything that you want, but when you understand that you have what you need, when you see the hand of God on your life, In spite of your craziness, because reality check, we don't always do what we're supposed to do. We don't always handle what we're supposed to handle. We don't always study the way that we should study. We don't worship the way that we should worship. But God still provides for us. God still takes care of us. God still gives us good things in spite of the fact that we don't always do good things. And we have to begin to acknowledge how good God is even when our equipment ain't working. Even when we can't walk the way that we want to walk. We can still attest to the goodness of God. When you study people with disabilities, you'll find some stories of some remarkable people who did things that able-bodied people could only imagine to do because they refused to allow their disability to hinder them from living life. And in fact, their disability activated things in them that, that, that seem supernatural. There are people who don't have eyes, they don't have the equipment to see, but yet their ears were enhanced and their ability to hear and navigate and move without the equipment of eyes far supersedes, supersedes even some people who have 20-20 vision. Why? Because they realized that although they have a hindrance, although they have a problem, there's so much more to be grateful for. So my question for you today, are you willing to shift to let go of your victimhood. Shift your language from being the victim to being the victor. And that's not just positive thinking. That is understanding your identity according to the scripture. That's understanding how great your God is. That's understanding the power and the authority that has been delegated to you on this rock. Although my church and the gates of hell should not prevail against it. And I've given you keys to the kingdom. You are a royal priest and the chosen generation. You are sons and daughters of God. You're no longer an orphan. That's what the scripture says about those who believe in Jesus. Do you believe it? Do you want to be made whole? Well, here's the third question. Are you willing to let go of your sin? Yeah, that's the doozy right there. I want to be healed. That's my desire. I I, I want to shift from being the victim to being the victor. But do I want to let go of the sin that's in my life? Now, what's interesting about this passage, we see no specific sin outlined for this man. But Jesus says, go and sin no more, lest a worse thing happen to you. Jesus knows way more than we know. So obviously Jesus could see beyond his external to see the internal. And he was able to see that this man had sin in his life. When I ask you the question, what's the greater healing? The physical healing or the spiritual healing? Jesus would demonstrate miracles to point to the fact that he is indeed the son of God. And to take it a step further, he demonstrated that he had the power to forgive of sins. What is greater, being able to make a man to walk or being able to forgive the sins of a man. He was pointing to the fact that only God himself can forgive the sins of a man, thus saying that I am the son of God. Jesus had the intention of healing not just that man's physical body, but also healing his soul. And people love the idea of Jesus healing their physical body. They love the idea of Jesus healing their bank account. They love the idea of Jesus healing their relationship woes. They love the idea of Jesus taking on their social causes. But but do you want Jesus to deal with the condition of your soul? And evidently this man didn't. He didn't know who Jesus was after he was healed. The Pharisees hemmed him up and said, who healed you? He said, I don't know. He bumped into Jesus at the grocery store with his new legs. <laughs> I'm painting a, a, a word picture for you. Jesus said, 
Stop sinning. Lest the worst thing come upon you. And then what does he do? He goes back to the Pharisees and say, I know who it was. It was Jesus. He was more concerned about self-preservation, self-preservation, preserving himself, taking care of himself, than actually following Jesus. So much so that he was willing to throw Jesus under the bus to keep the heat off of him, even though he had experienced the blessings of Jesus. And my concern with the church is that, that we'll come because we're trying to get our breakthrough. We'll come because we're trying to get our healing. We'll come to worship because we're looking for a mate and we just believe in God that he's going to provide it. We'll come because we want wealth and prosperity. We'll come because we want God to address our physical, natural, external circumstances. But we'll overlook this whole thing called sin. And we won't allow Jesus to deal with that part of us. And we want a bless me party. And we want to shout. And we want to dance. We want to fall out on the floor. But we don't want Jesus to deal with the sin that's in our life. So my question is, are you tired of being lame? This question is for all of us, from the pulpit to the pews. Are you tired of being lame? Or do you really want to be made whole? Are you willing to leave the victimhood in the past? Are you willing to let go of your sin? I believe that if you embrace those three things, that there is a shift that God wants you to participate in. And this shift will impact you first spiritually. Oh, but it will impact everything else that's in your life because the perspective that you have about Jesus, your perspective about what Jesus has come to do, your whole world will change when you realize that he is Lord. When you realize that he's worthy to be worshipped. When you realize that he just doesn't want us playing church. When, you, when we realize that this just isn't about coming in and sitting by the pool hoping that something happens and then getting frustrated when it doesn't happen for us. Jesus is here right now and he's asking the question, do you want to be made whole? So if your response is yes, I need you to stand on your feet. Lord God, I thank you for what you've done today. I thank you for that overflow of worship. Lord God, even as I was studying the scripture, this place where Jesus went to, this place called Bethesda, some translations say that this was the place of double overflow, the place of mercy. And Father, I pray that this will be a moment of double overflow, a moment of mercy. I believe that there are some people right now who've been waiting by the pool, just hoping that the waters would be stirred up. Thank you for being the God over the waters. Thank you for sending your son Jesus who controls the winds and the waves. Thank you for sending the Messiah who came not just to address our physical issues, but to also address the status of our soul. We come to him right now. And we ask him to heal us of every infirmity in our life. There'll be some who are dealing with physical infirmity, and we know that Jesus has the power to heal, demonstrated in this scripture. He was able to make that lame man walk by saying, get up. And we know that the same power that he had then is the same power that he has now. And so, Father, if it be your prerogative today to heal someone physically, would you speak now and address their physical ailment through your power? But Lord, we want more than just physical empowerment, more than just natural success. We want spiritual success. We want to be the type of vessel that is used by you. We want to be the type of person, dear God, whose soul is healthy, not just our physical exterior. Lord, what good is it to be able-bodied and spiritually disabled? What good is it to have all of our limbs working properly and yet be sick in our soul? What good is it to have a nice car, a better house, a mate, 
but to yet be distant from you and spiritually sick. Father, we just don't want to be made whole physically. We just don't want to become victorious in the natural. Father, we want you to address the sin that's in our life, and we want to sin no more. So, Father, would you speak to your people right now? Would you move in their hearts and in their minds? As we, dear God, move from this moment, I pray, Lord, that we would take courage and begin to do the things that you're leading us to do. By your power, we're going to get up, we're going to carry our mat, we're going to walk, and we're going to acknowledge you, and we're going to sin no more, that we are going to be your ambassadors and your representatives. Thank you for the grace to do this. We can't do it without you. We can't do it without you. We can't do it apart from your power. We can't move from victimhood to to victory just in our flesh. We have to make a decision. We have to make the desire that we want to be healed and whole. But we know that it is your work reforming us from the inside out, helping us, teaching us. The more we learn about your word, the more we learn about your ways, the better it helps us to be able to walk this thing called life out. Father, thank you. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray.